Tony, thank you very much for a very kind introduction, verbose but kind. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here, and uh, I always enjoy being uh, involved with uh, NIA, uh, and congratulations on all the contributions that you make individually and collectively in this organization, all you've done in animal agriculture over, over many years. So this is really an opportunity to step back, and I think some of these ideas are going to be a little bit different, but that's what these conferences are about. So I have a, maybe a little bit different look on animal agriculture going into the future, but it's, uh, it's extremely optimistic. Uh, and uh, when I'm done with this, um, I hope that you feel the same. So uh, in the short time that we have together, we'll kind of set the context. I know you've been doing that for uh, most of this meeting, and it reminds us of the word connexity, which is an old English word, which is a combination of interconnectedness and complexity. And probably that is the best uh, way that I can un to explain what I think the future is going to hold. I'll mention 22 uh, uh, threats and opportunities and see if uh, you concur. Uh, and then we'll really talk about shifting um, our focus from animal agriculture 1.0 to 2.0. What that means, how do we do it, and what the opportunities are. And it's a real shift uh, from just thinking about animal agriculture per se. is a real opportunity to uh, connect ourselves with improving people's lives. So how do we be successful in moving to agriculture 2.0? and then talk about uh, how we're going to do that and, and really think about reimagining ag animal agriculture and human health as being synonymous. And I think that is the real upside that I see and the real um, high point in our future. So uh, here we go, down the road and uh, taking the off-ramp. Uh, and somebody told me, you know, agriculture is no longer a Norman Rockwell painting. Well, that's for sure. Uh, and nobody knows better than the people in this room today the uh, amazing changes that are taking place in agriculture and consolidation uh, and, uh, and how we grow and rear uh, animals. So uh, let's take a look at how we actually look at agriculture, animal agriculture 2.0. Uh, some people believe that, that in animal agriculture, I believe that this is a time that, it's, that is very similar to 1980, uh, where an industry really changed, and that industry was information technology and computers, and that change took place because of the universal software. So for the first time, we had a, an operating system that were able to connect computers uh, and systems across the country. That was a change that just absolutely changed information systems, changed computer technology. And we may be sitting on the cusp of a change uh, kind of uh, relative to that. Uh, venture capital funds are flowing into ag animal agriculture, more than private funds, uh, certainly more than public funds. So somebody out there is seeing the real opportunities and the value in ab animal agriculture uh, that we haven't seen before in terms of promotion and kinds of R&D uh, actually flowing into this. The externalization of R&D. It's not just USDA anymore by a long shot. So there's a lot more private dollars moving into this and, and a lot more uh, venture capital moving into R&D because people see a new value a new value in the products of animal agriculture, and new possibilities as we move forward. Consumer is king, a new value of food and social choices. Our last speaker made, a, made that uh, point uh, very well. We talked about certified Angus and that pyramid and the importance of kind of that social value now that people are, and emotions that are people are putting in food, and that is translating into, in terms of their decision making. And we still suffer and have to kind of constantly kind of fight the battle, if you will, of this anti-science and anti-agriculture. Uh, we've been paid in into the corner to a certain extent. It's going to be difficult to kind of uh, uh, get out of that, although I think we can, but I think it's still one of the threats as we move into the future. The future of global trade agreements, you just uh, heard a really good talk about the remarkable growth of certified Angus internationally. But what would worry me is what would we have, what would happen right now if, we, if the trade agreement to, to Mexico fell through? I mean, it would be a huge impact right now to so not only dairy, but to, to, to beef. Uh, so this is, I think, a truism. We'll see more changes in the next five years and in the last three decades in animal agriculture. With consolidation, new entries, these are non-agriculture entries that are moving into food, food processing and agriculture that see a new future for it, and a fusion of industries and science that we haven't seen before. Uh, and that fusion is really creating great opportunities as we move forward. 
unprecedented research opportunities. Uh, it, I think it's, there's more astound, outstanding research uh, and breakthrough science than, in agriculture and animal agriculture than any time I've seen in the last 50 years. That, that's how remarkable it really is. And the advantages that we have. And that's also in the, on the plant side. Labor uncertainty. So what's going to happen with immigration, certainly shifting more and more to mechanization, but a certain part of animal agriculture is certainly uh, heavily related to um, uh, people working and, and immigration and capitalization can't take advantage or, or make up for all of that. Food security we already know about. We already know about food insecurity and the impact on people's lives, not only globally, but in the United States. Food waste, opportunity, um, and a real threat. So this food waste, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, um, is, I think, a great opportunity in animal agriculture because what's not been cal calculated is the waste that could be saved by reducing animal diseases and mortality uh, and optimizing reproductive performance. Uh, a huge potential increase um, in optimizing production and production systems, alleviating poverty as a global initiative. It's already People are already investing in that. So I think animal agriculture understands that, that we're part of that solution, but how do we do that to, to move forward? So animal agriculture uh, and agriculture are really, I see, blurring these intellectual domains. So we're already doing business with uh, medical companies. We're doing business with social science, with engineering, uh, with business. And new uh, opportunities, new value is being created as we move forward. And if you just look at the future of animal agriculture, changes in genetics, genomics, health and data analysis, and what we're able to do to put all that data together, like the 1980 um, uh, change in, in the computer systems. And I think the real upside um, is agriculture and human health. Uh, and it uh, is going to require a different kind of mindset to do that, but it's a remarkable opportunity for all of us, I think, in this room today. Digital farms, uh, how these platforms are changing, how information is being gathered, analyzed, and put forward and added new value as people now can make better decisions based on all of this information coming to them. A rural America. Great opportunities, I believe, as we look at um, over 500 counties in the United States that are considered uh, Appalachian counties. Uh, and what's going to happen as they are trying but desperately to kind of move out of uh, areas of new industry and new jobs and agriculture, even though they're kind of number one economy in many of these counties, still has a long ways to go. And it's, it really is another opportunity as far as I can see. So the 1.6 planets really comes out of uh, Elanco and uh, their kind of conversation about uh, this is what we need. So we are not just producing uh, animal products for uh, one planet, but we already have 60% more that we have to do. Uh, and can we do that as we grow more and more product and uh, pr produce it and, and uh, move it around the world? A thriving demand for protein. Global health impact of poor nutrition and hunger on people's lives and productivity. So right now, uh, globally, in uh, the poorest countries in the world, uh, the stunting rate uh, because of poor nutrition and lack of food is 37% of all infants and young people. Uh, and that 37% of stunting is just not physical. It's also mental. Uh, and these young people never actually catch up. They have a problem through the rest of their lives, and it's something that could be corrected in the first um, few years of life. Uh, food and health. So agriculture, as we stand here today, impacts about 80, about 75% of our health determinants. Not where we have a hospital, not how we get vaccinated, not how we're treated for disease. And I'm going to talk about this as I think the, the real upside and the real possibility for animal agriculture moving forward. And then the strategic inflection points that we've all talked about. Right? And we've, we've been working on these from animal welfare. And Tony's done a great job in, in this state in setting, setting standards. Uh, and emerging infections in people. We just heard about H7 and 9. Uh, and that's not going to go away. So as we stand here today, we are probably at a point in time where we have the greatest probability of a pandemic than any other time that we've faced. The greatest probability of a pandemic today than any time previous. And we've already had a number of pandemics. Antimicrobial resistance and the social responsibility that we have uh, that I think that we uh, need to uh, be given more credit for 
ecological re resilience, how we continue to move forward, and, of course, food safety. So this is a time of uh, strategic inflection points. It's a point in time that organizations, companies, or industries actually go through. And these are points in time that are so profound that an industry does one of two things. It either takes these opportunities and advances them and sees them as opportunities and successfully thwarting a threat, or it will be reduced to declines, loss of control, uh, and being ineffective. And I believe we're really at kind of the crosshairs, if you will, or at the inflection point of many of these things that are facing us. So nothing says we automatically are going to go ahead and go to agri animal agriculture 2.0. So that is part of all of our responsibility here today. And for me, uh, and I've had one foot in public health and one foot in uh, agriculture and animal agriculture, it is that fusion and understanding that what you do and what I do and the food we produce really has uh, are meeting the needs of society. I think we just haven't told that story well enough. The most serious challenge in animal agriculture is to reestablish its social responsibility its relevance as a positive factor for improving lives. So we don't just rear animals, right? We improve lives. And uh, the last speaker talked uh, very, I, I enjoyed the conversation about rebranding. So he's rebranding a product, really talking about rebranding the relevance of, of what this product really is. Unprecedented and extraordinary research. As I said, I've never seen a time like this. We're looking at genomic changes, gene editing, changes in the microbiome on how we actually can alter uh, growth. Uh, there's um, um, looking at data analysis, precision agriculture, precision animal agriculture, beneficial microbes. So we know today a company, just because of changing the microbes in its soil, can actually increase the production of winter wheat by 10%. No fertilizer, just microbes changing the whole microbe, and just think what we're thinking about doing now in animal agriculture and that remarkable possibility. The Internet of all things. It's that connectivity. It's the digital farm. It's the digital opportunities to put all the data together, make better choices, better decisions that we haven't been able to make before. Food waste, shelf life, and behavior science is, is all a part of that. I'm going to mention that in just a second. Reduction in animal breeding and mortality. So we don't know the exact statistics, but in the United States, it may be 20%. 20% loss of production because of morbidity and mortality uh, and poor re re uh, reproductive performance. It's pretty low worldwide, where we see in the developing world 40 to 50%. 40 to 50% of reduction of protein sources because of animal diseases, mortality, and poor reproductive performance. Now, you want to talk about waste. That is an unbelievable waste. And opportunity is, un is remarkable as well. How do we actually change that? Uh, we can have the same number of animals or even less and produce much more protein. So it's something I think we, uh, uh, that we need to do as we move ahead. Climate smart production. So, you know, not to be kind of politically correct here about climate change, uh, but it is a factor in terms of changing um, seasons, changing uh, storms, changing um, how we how we look at climate. There's a whole company in Climate Corp uh, that actually was end up being sold, but is now part of the data analysis of making decisions about agriculture. The environmental sustainability has to include profitability. So I'm not one of these people to come and talk about um, prima donnas saying that we just have to change the environment and resilient. Being more resilient, than we do, but we also have to make it more profitable as we do it. Uh, USDA research and um, I, you know, I, th I think we're at a point in time where we have to question um, right now uh, research in agriculture is about $12.4 billion um, uh, from the private sector and $4.2 billion from the um, public sector. Uh, so uh, right now, federal government is about 17% of R&D for agriculture, and animal agriculture is probably 75% less of that. So we really need to uh, decide over the last 100 years why this great product productivity has taken place in agriculture. It's because of research and the adaptability of those research findings as we move forward. Are we still going to be able to do that? Who's responsible? We really appreciate much more private funding coming into it, um, but uh, it makes us wonder about the future of um, 
of, of public funding of R&D. So digital farms, it's here, it's really moving, especially in precision agriculture where literally every seed can have a decision made about um, fertilizer, about uh, water content, about germination, uh, all done by computers, uh, uh, all done by enormously sophisticated systems that are changing the efficiency of production. Uh, and precision agriculture is going to move into precision agri animal agriculture. No question about it as we go into gene editing and these remarkable data analytical possibilities. Today, if you are in crop agriculture uh, and you were putting in a crop of, say, a 1,000 acres, you have 40 decision points. 40 decision points. Uh, and there's a huge need now to uh, simplify that in a way that uh, the digital farm actually becomes together and we actually can make better decisions and just not have more data. Same thing happening in our dairies and same thing happening in, uh, certainly in poultry as that, mo as that moves forward. So we're going to have precision livestock. There's no question uh, about that. And it's a fusion of machine, agronomic, and management data all coming together uh, and enabling us to be more efficient as we go forward. It's pretty exciting. Externalization of research and development. We just talked about this decline in public funding. Um, and, uh, and the pickup of private R&D, because people now see a new value and a new worth uh, in R&D, uh, and venture funds are now moving in. Uh, we saw that in crop agriculture. Now we're actually seeing it in animal agriculture in a big way. The global change is um, it's unfortunate. China now spends two times more on agriculture R&D than this country. So where do you think that's going to head as an outcome? So pretty, pretty remarkable. New partners. We talked about the fusion of new science, uh, new thematic areas from engineering, breeding, public health, genomics, medicine. They're all creating new science, uh, new jobs, new opportunities, and more efficient production of animal proteins. Food and technology and the creation of new products, for sure. And uh, what some people believe is happening and right on the, the next movement in the next five years is a fusion of platforms and looking at plant R&D and animal R&D, animal agriculture R&D, to look at exchanges uh, across these and also changes across human health and animal health. So it's a new dimension of collaboration. So the role of America, I think, uh, continues to be... Um, uh, a, a story that's uh, unfolding. Uh, it's a story that uh, is a key part of our future in this country, not only in Appalachia, but certainly in parts of the Midwest and, and, and our plains. And it has a social and political reality of emerging importance. Uh, and that creates opportunities as we move forward. And that is, uh, for example, what if we increased animal agriculture uh, two, twofold in the Appalachian counties? Uh, what if we put an infrastructure in place, and what might that do for jobs uh, as we move ahead? And could that be done? Consolidation uh, has not been helpful to all communities, uh, especially some of the smaller communities, and what are we going to do about that? So rural America encompasses a huge land, huge land mass, millions of people, uh, and they're shifting in many areas from what we call extraction industries, um, uh, whether that's coal or whether that's um, forestry. Uh, trying to recreate themselves into new industries. Agriculture has the greatest possibility of creating those, uh, that economic well-being as we move, as we move forward. Poverty, result of, um, both a result of poor health and the cause of poor health and a key focus in animal agriculture. So again, it's that rebrand as you look at Animal Ag 2.0. It's not about our products, uh, the quality of our products, which we're proud of, but it is about improving people's lives. Uh, and we have got to tell that story uh, a lot better, and we have to use it to create uh, jobs and opportunities in the parts of this country that really need it. So this economics and recovery in rural America, new potential uh, I, I'm sure of in animal agriculture. Food security, uh, big area. Uh, we add a million people to the face of the earth every week. Think about that. A million people to the face of the earth every week. Uh, and that uh, is not changing in the foreseeable future. 90% of that growth is in the developing world. The very part of the world that has very little R&D, doesn't have infrastructure, uh, but has a population increase um, that we're going to have to help feed and to figure out how we're going to do that. So producing more food in the next 40 years than during the last 500 years. 
So if you want to talk about animal agriculture 2.0, uh, that's enough of an impetus in and by itself. So it's a challenge to this idea that we have to increase our livestock production and poultry production by 50% within perhaps 10 to 12 years. Um, uh, people are moving into uh, more and more into the urban areas, and that changes. And I'm going to just mention the cost of zoonotic uh, diseases and one health. So uh, last year, we actually produced more than 40 billion food animals worldwide to help feed about 7.5 billion people. And now we have to contemplate feeding 10 billion people and increasing animal agriculture production and, and protein resources by 50%. Now that's really good news. The challenge is, how are we going to do that? How are we going to sustain that? Right? Uh, and uh, is that really feasible? I believe it is, by the way. World meat consumption. Um, the red line, just uh, not to go into this in detail, million metric tons the red line really is an, is an indicator of uh, meat consumption in the developing world. Uh, and the blue line is in um, the developed world, U.S., West, Japan, Western Europe. So the big growth in consumption of protein is in the developing world. So that is, for us, good news. Uh, that is a, um, a demand for animal protein. So it is different than what we, used to, we know of is the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution was remarkable in terms of what happens in plant agriculture in particular. It was supply-driven by new efficiencies, fertilizer, and new ways of producing crops. This, ladies and gentlemen, is demand-driven. The need and the demand for animal protein is different. It's not a supply issue. It is a demand issue. And that's why we have to, right today, produce for 1.6 globes. Poverty and hunger, and uh, I just want to go through this to get to one thing. Uh, this is something I think that uh, people around the world or have not been uh, picked up on, uh, and that's the idea that if you look at the 56 uh, zoonotic diseases globally, okay, the top ones, they're responsible for 2.5 billion human illnesses. Now think about malaria, think about HIV, think about tuberculosis, those are in the millions. This is a B number. And people are getting infected more times every year. WHO says one out of every 10 infections around the world are foodborne. But can you imagine uh, the savings uh, and the contributions we make or could make by reducing these zoonotic diseases in the poorest countries in the world that now are 2.5 billion cases and the huge impact that has on their lives? Of the top zoonotic diseases, most have high impact on livestock, uh, wildlife, and interfaces, and are agriculturally amenable. That means that the answer or the solution involves agriculture. It's, again, a remarkable opportunity. So we already talked a little bit about uh, food as a source of value, uh, and, and the labels are starting to come out with that, not only about the quality of that product, but their... Um, they're fair trade, they have uh, no GMOs, uh, no BST, uh, animal welfare standards are involved, um, no antibiotics, uh, and, and this is uh, worrisome uh, for all of us. Uh, and I'm also hearing now about um, animal agriculture and protein with, uh, where antibiotics, where vaccines are not used for animals. Well, that's the kind of things that we're kind of to hear, but somehow they get, they get, it gets caught on. So, um, Alternatives to antibiotics, for sure, big area of R&D right now, uh, and solutions, I think, coming forward. So this public perception about what we've learned. So, uh, so we went ahead and marketed GMO products, uh, BST products, um, without having a conversation with the public. And the backlash has been um, sizable. So as you move ahead, especially with gene editing, which CRISPR, which I think is the remo most remarkable research finding that, that I've seen in decades, right? We're going to have to be able to test that on the public uh, after we've just gone through GMOs and BST to make it acceptable. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to have this efficiency that we've hoped to have before. So this coalition that has uh, gone together and talked about industrialized farming and um, why we need organics, the degradation of the environment and carbon footprint, um, is here to stay, and uh, we have to uh, adjust to that, and we have to have a conversation about that. 
So we can no longer have our producers and farmers being disconnected from the public. Uh, I don't think that we are, but I think we have a long ways to go of holding that con conversation. So we don't really articulate the value of our products and the benefit to human and community health and vitality. Just think about a brand or an image of animal agriculture that really is central to right, the vitality and health of people in our communities. Um, I think that's where the action is. So um, I'm going to pass on some of these and just because we need more time. Uh, the need for One Health, um, it, it's, it's there. We've, you know, we've talked about this. Um, and um, uh, here are the determinants of uh, your health and my health. So these are uh, World Health Organization's five determinants of population health. So I'm going to ask you, um, um, how much does hospitals and medical care um, mean to your health? Well, it means a lot, but it's only about, it's less than 25% of your health for over a lifetime. So the real factors are in environment, environment that we live, right? Social economic conditions, poverty, uh, and in choices that people make in their behaviors. Together, that is 75% of the determinants of your health. Think of that. And your genetics, which we might be able to change probably in the near future, uh, and actually the health of our hospitals and physicians and healthcare system, right, is less than 25% of your determinants of your health. So why don't why is an animal agriculture involved in promoting what we do so well, and that is 75% of your health we can actually be involved in and have a good story to tell? We really do. Uh, and that's here's the story. Animal agriculture's impact on our health determinants. We talk about millennial goals. So what is it around the world that we're trying to do? Poverty, hunger, disease, environment, child, and maternity health. We can focus and we can put and animal agriculture, goals and strategies that actually connect every one of those. We're involved in positive environmental changes and water quality, new energy sources, nutrient management in different ways. We're changing be people's behavior because we're going to give them different sources, different access to their food, different kinds of food, uh, nutrition changes, prevention and disease. Uh, and we're going to have a new era in the next five to 10 years that matches precision agriculture uh, and personalized medicine, where we're going to be able to produce livestock and poultry and those products that are going to be able to match your genomic change and understanding your genome individually, which will be a commonplace in the very near future, and to be able to understand animal protein and our sources of food can actually not be just sustaining, sustaining us, but actually can uh, change our productivity, uh, our life expectancy, and, uh, uh, and reduce chronic disease. Think about the strategy and marketing of that. So, so that is, is not science fiction. Social economic factors, it's about jobs, uh, it, you know, kind of as we, as we move forward. So right now we worry about people undernourished, uh, the bottom one billion. And we also know right now there's more people overnourished than undernourished. Uh, right now it's estimated that one out of every four human diseases and conditions, especially chronic diseases, are directly related to food. So the positive and negative to that is what could we do then with food that will actually positively impact, whether that's diabetes, obesity, nutritional status as we move forward. So we have to end up, uh, have to end up doing four. So just a couple things in closing. So right now the healthcare system in the United States, right, costs $3.3 trillion. Fastest growing part of our gross domestic product. $3.3 trillion. Think of that. Are we going to go bankrupt? I know in the state of Ohio, Tony knows because we worked on the budget at the same time, half of this state's budget is in Medicare and Medicaid. Half. Think about that. So if you're in an industry like we are, right, that can actually impact the determinants of people's health 75%, how much can we reduce and prevent disease and illness of this $3.3 trillion at a time that it's right sp uh, spiraling out of control. Wow, that is real opportunity. That is agriculture, animal agriculture 2.0.
And can we set goals to do that? Can that be done? It's not a pipe dream. So it can be done. Uh, and I think it is a, a part of our future. Uh, we worry about the bottom uh, 1 billion, uh, moving to 2 billion as people become urbanized and what's going to happen with new emerging zoonoses diseases. And one more point. So why should where you live make a difference in how long you live? So you're sitting right in the middle of Franklin County. This is a map of Franklin County, Ohio. And from where you sit right now, if you moved out 25 miles from this point where you're at in any direction, you will see a difference of 20, of 20 years of life expectancy. 20 years. And you're right in the middle of the best medical system in the country, in the world. It's not making a difference. So where's the impact? Environment, poverty, people's choices. They don't get good food. They don't make good choices. They're not well-educated. Poverty is a huge part of that. What part of animal agriculture and what we do can actually change that? And I believe we actually can change that. Uh, it's about prevention of disease, uh, and it is, the I think, the most astounding possibility as we move into agriculture, animal agriculture 2.0. Talked about One Health and this idea that right now anything happens in animal health or human health, environmental health, are all connected. And our new strategies are about uh, that interconnectivity, uh, new interventional strategies that move upstream toward prevention and not add to $3.3 trillion of disease control or disease care, which is what our medical system is. So at $3.3 trillion, 97% goes to disease care. 3% to prevention. We could move that uh, ratio, if you will, because of our industry and what we do. So we face these uh, un uncertainties as you move ahead. You know what they are. Uh, this, is not a, this is not a linear world. Disruptions are now more common than not. Uh, and how quickly those can take place, and these are the things we worry about. Uh, so the road is unclear. We have to learn how to, to move ahead. This is what we don't want to wake up to in terms of disruptions and public relations, in terms of um, FMD in, in England. Um, and we worry about H7s and, uh, and these global pandemics and the public perception of what they see on our industry. So um, the great excitement about the future is that we can still shape it. And we still can create it. So I'm going to, I'm going to move into um, a couple ways to think about doing that. I'm going to end. One is growing bigger minds to solve bigger problems. So what we have are really difficult, complex, wicked problems. They can't be solved by yes and no answers. Uh, and these wicked problems uh, demand new solutions and old solutions that we use no longer work. So we're actually in the middle of this transition, if you will, of, of thinking about what we can do in, in different ways. The future that I see uh, has never been more rich, our possibilities greater, uh, more promising, but it's not guaranteed. So being responsive, being responsible as an industry, I think we are, and being relevant. And that relevance is not just increasing our production and our marketing of our products. That relevance is in particular right, improving people's lives. And, and we do that now, uh, and we can do a lot more of it as we move forward. So reinventing animal agriculture 2.0. Any organization that can't reimagine its deepest sense of what it is, what it does, and how it competes or operates will soon be rendered obsolete. That is the rapid changes in the next five years in this industry, more than any time in the last 30 years. Are you ready? Do we see that as an advantage? And these last two slides then are really talking about fundamental reset. What is it that we need to do to go from animal agriculture 1.0 to 2.0? What is that major transformation or change? Number one, acquiring the skills of an interdependent, new collaborations, new partnerships, and innovation. The shift that I see, especially from the veterinary side and the agriculture side, is this difficulty in our strong independence that we really like uh, and is part of our culture now to being an interdependent. We're dependent on consumers, on retailers, and now other industries. And how do we really are skillful in doing that. Adopting new scientific findings and technology to feed 10 billion people. Great opportunity. I think this is a real upside. I think we can do it. 
uh, but we better not fall back on R and D like like we're ha like it's happening right now. We need to articulate your value and societal benefits. We don't articulate that well at all, and we have so much to tell. And as we move into the future, it's going to be a big part of what we do. So our mission is: we don't rear animals, poultry, but we improve lives. Uh, and that goal is very different. Uh, I learned that a long time ago in food safety. We understood that our responsibility in rearing livestock and poultry doesn't stop at the farm gate. It extends past that. And that extension to understand that we're part of the food safety solution is now happening in terms of our relevance, in terms of societal values, and in terms of people's health. So we have to be proactive, transparent, and not play defense about these difficult conversations because they're going to continue. Embracing food and health in all of its dimensions. Precision agriculture, precision medicine, um, public health and agriculture, a whole new possibility. For the first time in this state, we have extension service, extension service that is hiring the first group of masters of public health to work on opiate out, on the opiate outbreak. Number one health issue in this state. It's a bullseye. Extension service in every county, right? Every county, 88 professional educators. And the Dean of Public Health said in a public forum, he believes that the highway to the public health in a state like Ohio is extension service. Wow. Well, that's 2.0. Those are the things that we do to change people's lives as we go forward. And to end, so our commitment to address the problems of, um, of rural society, these poverty issues and health, shifting to more equitable research funding and all, um, uh, just to throw out an idea, um, NIH gets $34 billion. They're not going to get cut, by the way. People think they're going to get cut. They're not, it's not going to happen. Uh, but we can get cut in USDA. Uh, and I, you know, I'm worried that maybe, maybe R&D, maybe research out of agriculture should move out of USDA. Maybe it ought to be independent. Maybe it ought to someplace else uh, along the mall in D.C. Uh, and be funded separately because we're catching it we are the rear end, if you will, of real public funding and research. So if they get a cut in USDA on one side, we've suffered because in our research efforts. And over the last hundred years, it's been a remarkable uh, benefit to our lives. So just an idea. Leverage this global demand for animal sources and poverty alleviation. Food security is part of our national security. Wow, there's a rebrand of mission. Countries that have food insecurities have social unrest and real problems. And now this has become agriculture and security has become part of the agenda of our national security. New opportunity, a new agenda, and a new way of looking at this. Utilizing this great data set, if you will, uh, of, of our farms and information systems. And, and, and the final thing is, this is a I think a moment in time that's galvanizing or should galvanize animal agriculture. I haven't seen anything else uh, where the timing for moving from this idea of 1.0 to 2.0 is more relevant. And it needs strong leadership. And that's why I appreciate the state veterinarians here, um, our, our folks in industry, our folks in USDA, um, and, and all of you. Uh, this is about leadership. This NIAA has always stepped forward in a strong leadership position, and I believe you uh, can help lead the way as we make this remarkable transition to from 1.0 to 2.0. Um, it's a pretty remarkable opportunity and time.